Welcome to the DSEF. The Direct Selling Executives Forum was created to be a place where real direct selling executives and vendors in the space can come out and share solutions to challenges that face us all in the marketplace. Our guest today is going to be unpacking a topic and sharing their raw thoughts for you to learn from. All right, let's go meet our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our next panel for the Direct Selling Executives Forum. You're in for a total treat today. As you can see, we have Miss Sarah Robbins uh, joining us here for the call. And for those of you that are are not familiar with Sarah's story. She is one of the world's leading network marketers, has been the number one earner and top team builder in her company. She uses a system she teaches called the Multiply Method, and her team has broke records in our industry, hitting over a billion dollar per year in sales in record breaking. Wow. You got to understand that that's literally $83 million a month plus of volume uh, going through her organization. That's a lot of people moving a lot of product to a lot of happy customers at the end of the day. Um, she shares her best practices and her best selling book, Rock Your Network Marketing Business. If you haven't yet gotten a copy, go to your favorite place to get books and get a copy of Sarah's book. She also provides coaching for network marketers in the network marketing inner circle and hosts a mastermind for top leaders in the profession, the Made to Multiply Mastermind. Uh, she's a wife to her awesome husband, Phil. She's mom to Gabrielle, who's eight, Judah, three. And these are her, what, who she calls her greatest accomplishments. Sarah and Phil build orphanages overseas, providing housing, training, nutrition, and support. And as a former educator, this is near and dear to Sarah's heart. She's a coach, consultant, keynote speaker, champion of the network marketing profession. Learn more about Sarah at sarahrobbins.com. Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. It's a total treat to have you on. Thank you. This is a treat. It's been a long time coming. I'm so glad we could make this happen. Uh, me as well. And it's so fun. Our, as parents, we both, our kids are the exact same age. My daughter just turned eight yesterday. So with Gabriel being eight, we can make a deal. So this works perfect. So yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite That's one. Awesome. It's funny. <laughs> and, and I love your story as an educator. My sister was a high school English teacher when she got into direct sales and network marketing at, at 23 years old. And I saw that as a 16 year old and that was how I found the industry. And so our stories are like interwoven and connected in so many spots. Well, with today's topic, gang, we are going to be unpacking a discussion that came off of a panel. Sarah and I were together at the DSLC conference in Austin, Texas, and she was unpacking this idea of how field leaders own culture in an organization. And as soon as she came off stage, we're sitting at a table and I said, Sarah, we have to unpack that on a podcast. Like that was, that was really good, this, this idea. And so with that, we're going to go ahead and start our session. So let's, we're going to go ahead and pass it to you, Omar, and we'll, and we'll get the episode rolling. The stage is yours. Thank you, Ben. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome to our DSEF show today. The subject for today, as Ben said, how field leaders own culture. So my question from the panel is, you've been a long-time field leader who has consistently had over a billion dollars of volume in your business, empowering thousands of men and women around the globe. Before we jump into the panel, where did it all start with you? Why did you get into the space in the first place? Well, as Ben brought up kind of this little topic, teachers, mm -hmm. I was a teacher and I absolutely love teaching. I taught lower elementary, kindergarten, first grade. And while I love teaching, unfortunately, because of Michigan's economy, it was a recession of 08. We all know what happened to Motown, Motor City. So families were moving, schools were closing. And although I was the most requested teacher in the building, teacher tenure Trump's performance. So I was facing the loss of my job and my search led me to my company. I did not find it in direct sales. So it first was a retail brand. I was supplementing my income, working part-time as a product educator and honestly happened to be in the right place at the right time when wow. they were looking for ways that they could reach the masses. And they said, hey, wow. good news, bad news. Bad news, you'll lose this job. <laughs> so there it was again. But the good news is we have another opportunity for you. We're leaving retail. We're going into direct sales. Do you want to do this? Now, I'll be honest. I was young. I had no network. I was broke. I had 19 cents in my bank account. My network, they were all young and broke as well. But it was my mom who was a savvy, successful serial entrepreneur who was like, Sarah, I know the stories. I know the potential. Mm. We would be crazy not to do this. So 
We started our business. This is now going on 17 years for us, which is so incredible. And man, time flies when you're having fun. And for me, I say, you know, I get to teach and train just in a different way. Yeah. And also to just continue to make a great impact with what we're doing through our own foundation, opening up um, orphanages overseas, funding education, nutrition for children all around the globe. So it's been such a beautiful transforming industry. And I'm just so blessed that it's been a part of our story. I love that. Oh, I appreciate it. You know, I, th I think through that opportunity and it speaks to taking that next step and, and then the commitment of time, you know, it wasn't a short-term commitment at your company, you know, you're talking about 17 years of just continually yeah. executing every day and uh, showing up here in the space. And, and, and if we think about just what those last 17 years have been, you know, they've been major culture shifts in even how our profession works. And so that's why yeah. I love uh, the topic today, simply because of, you know, you, it wasn't, it, you're, you're like Taylor Swift. There's been eras, right? There's been eras for Sarah Roberts and, uh, you know, she just came off of her eras tour, right? That everyone talks about. We say, well, you know, Sarah, you've been through some eras of direct sales, referral marketing of, of what's expected of someone in the field of, of how we share with one another, of how we connect to others. And so you're, you're kind of like Bono, you know, you had each of these chapters in your life from Madonna, like it's not, it's not, it hasn't been just, oh, that's one story and we're on it the whole time. No, there's been a lot of uh, change over those last 17 years and uh, navigating that take, takes a special, a special kind of leadership and a, a special yeah. kind of uh, system. Yeah. yeah. Leaders play Shoot. the long game and they lead with legacy in mind. I always tell people, pick one, stick with one, build to the top. And, you know, it's just like the economy. There's ups and downs. We're going to have challenges and achievements. But, you know, some of the most successful people I know, I look at Donna Johnson, one of my mentors, she's been in her business for decades and just seeing the long-term history, commitment, vision, et cetera, over time compounded when you think about what that success looks like long-term, it really is powerful. So again, it has been just incredible. And I also, I was thinking what you said earlier about that Biz Stone quote, it says, Timing, perseverance, and 10 years of trying eventually make me look like an overnight success, right? We hear these stories and it's like, well, wait a minute. Oh, you know, she's been there for over a decade or two decades or three decades. Yeah. And so it's been really encouraging for me when I see, you know, different changes and shifts and all of that to look back at some of my mentors and say, well, they went through the very same thing, right? And They've maintained success in their company, a lot of these legacy companies mm -hmm. over time. And that wow. is what is so encouraging and so powerful. Agreed. Wow. Great. Totally agreed. Amen. Right, the next question is, as a top leader in our space, you and your leaders created a pact for core values to design the experience you wanted other referral members to have and how you would treat one another that was above and beyond what was the uh, what the corporate team did. What did the process look like and what has the impact been? Oh, so powerful. We created from the very beginning. We recently updated a code of ethics that we as top leaders came up with, signed our names to, agreed to, to basically say, hey, this is how we choose to operate in this space, how we're going to treat one another and speak about one another, how we're going to treat our corporate team and speak about them, how we're choosing to operate in our business. Because in reality too, it's like things have shifted even as we know, we were just at that compliance conference, even in the regulatory space. So are there are things that we can agree to as field members that necessarily, you know, it's not something that our company is going to guide and direct, but we can choose to guide and direct to within, you know, the field. And it really is about creating a safe space that we can plug our teams into. So for example, we said, so we've hosted weekly calls for as long as I've been in the company. When there was no system when we first started, we created one and we host weekly opportunity calls, weekly training calls. And we said, you know what, in order to participate in these, because at the end of the day, these are being shown to a lot of people. We have hundreds of thousands of people on our team. We're servicing millions of customers. We're bringing in new people into business. January was a record breaking month for us. And we're saying, in order to have that seat at the table, right? 
I remember, I think Randy Gage, he always says the platform is a privilege, right? Yes. So if you're going to be featured yeah. in front of all of these people, all of these guests that are looking at our business as an opportunity, there's a certain commitment that we're making to the business that if people are following us on social media after whatever the case may be, are they going to see that there's some consistency, consistency in the company that we're working in the company that we keep and again, how we're operating as top leaders. So yeah. we recently came together, updated it, signed it, and you know we're able to really look at the team systems that we're putting into place and really operating with a standard of excellence. And it's really cool because we had hundreds of leaders just raise their hand and go, I'm all in, you know? And so for us, we don't have to necessarily in, of course, we have an amazing corporate team that supports us from a compliance level, but we really have said, let's dig in at the culture level. You know, it's not about having to be police and patrolled when you create a culture of excellence that people want to participate in and stay in, which is why I believe we have been seen for a long time as some of the darlings of direct sales is the company that people look to because of the standard of excellence that we've created, not only at the corporate level, but also in the field as well. So, so what are some of those actually look like, Sarah? Like if someone had a copy of your code of ethics and they were looking at it and they, they yeah. got three or four <laughs> points, which ones would you, would you be open to sharing? Just two or three of those of saying like, yeah, you know, well, I think these you were know, things that were really important. Yeah. Yeah. So first and foremost, I think, um, you know, how we choose to speak about one another that we're saying there's no gossip you know we're, we're all here for one thing it's one team one mission changing a lot of lives you know here's how we choose to treat one another mm -hmm. as it relates to our corporate team you know if there's issues we're not going on these big you know threads on social media and talking about all of the challenges we go out and up we bring it to the person that it, it involves for the purpose of solving a problem. So again, it's no gossip. We're coming together to problem solve and to move the business forward. So it's mm -hmm. about, you know, again, the, the tone that we set. For us, we're also saying too, that if you're hosting these calls and we're promoting you out to our team, again, this is nothing the company has said. It's a standard we have set that we're working one business, we're promoting one business because otherwise, it's a massive distraction to our team. And again, this is something we came together and said, this is not corporate led. This is not a standard that they've set for us. We've said, this is something we're choosing to do together yeah. as leaders and unanimously masses of these leaders said, yes, I'm in, this is what we want to do. We really want to focus on helping our team build the business that they came to us for, you know, and teaching them to build straight to the top. And as a result, we've replicated so many top leaders, so many incredible stories. And I think the beauty of our business is this really came as a fresh crop of, of people who didn't have channel experience. I think that's yeah. what makes our company so unique Yeah, is didn't carry well. And, and let me just say, there's two sides of it. Sure. We didn't carry the success of, you know, okay, here's people who had all the experience in the industry. So we really built from the ground up but also two, we didn't carry any of the baggage <laughs> from the industry as well. Sure. We came in totally fresh and it's like, here's the standard for how we're going to operate. And we really have created an incredible culture. And you know, something you mentioned, Ben, was there's so many changes that will happen in our industry, not one company, it's in our industry. And as I talk to women in our mastermind, they will all tell you it's in our industry. So what has carried us through changes over the years? It has been the culture. I think too often we look at how do we keep people in, right? It's like, or, or I'm sorry, how do we keep people from leaving? And it's, sure. that's really scarcity thinking. How do we keep people from leaving? Well, yeah. it's not rules and regulation. If you creating a culture that's so good that people want to stay. Yeah. And that's the key for when there's changes, because there will be in every company. I been telling everybody about the Brett Blake books about we're reading one now system scale, but also too, he talks about, you know, changes that all of these legacy companies will see in the industry. It's not 
if it happens, it is when it happens, because we've seen it, you and I, anybody else in the industry, no matter how big the company, listen, you, you go through momentum mode, you plateau, you take the dips, you build again. But the thing that he said, so in renewal for field leaders is that renewal, if you grow again, it's dependent on the field. Yeah. What does the field do? So again, that's part of the culture that we've created as we've you know come together as leaders. And it, it's so powerful to hear uh, just what you shared because you know we we get that this is a volunteer army. You know, as independent contractors in a company, there's only so much the company can say or require of a certain culture, and it does come down to field leaders. It's an incredible part to hear that the field would come together and say, hey, you know what? Uh, for those that are going to be speaking on our calls and those are going to be featured here, we're we're the folks that are only doing this company. Like we're not going to confuse the message. So just as a recap, for those of you that are listening in your car or watching online, you know, Sarah's saying that right here in the code of ethics, right? The leaders that are presenting aren't promoting four or five different business opportunities that would confuse, you know, anyone who sees them on a on a webinar that then later sees them on social media talking about something else. And as a company, you can't demand that, right? You you won't work. Uh, you're independent contractors. But as a leadership team, you can. One of the other things in the field, you can. And one of the other pieces Sarah just unpacked that I believe is just critical is this whole we're one team, one system, one body building this business. I love that approach and have seen that continue to weather storms as markets change for companies. Because when someone knows I can enroll my friend Tammy in Orange County, California, and she's going to have a local community and systems that are the same message she's going to hear in little old St. Louis, East St. Louis, Illinois, versus the same old Cleveland, Ohio, versus the same old Nashville, Tennessee, there is some beauty in that of the shared experience of the community and culture being, yeah, we do this platform and we follow up this way and we use these systems. And so that comes from a team unifying, you know, the field leaders unifying over that shared vision. And that's not easy. And so, oh my, I know the next panel question was really about that. Like how from the corporate team uh, can we even get, invite our leaders to do what Sarah's done at her company? So let, let's go to the panel question that came from the forum because I, I think it's a perfect next step. Sure. Absolutely. For executives at other companies, you know, would like to encourage their leaders to be a part of the conversation on the core values and uh, design the experience for their members. Uh, what would you suggest they do? Uh, are there any frameworks you would like to share? So our company has been so awesome about really collaborating and co-creating where they can, because we all know there are places where things are baked, it's a done deal. And because of things that are, again, are beyond our control, they're decisions that have to be made. The beauty is because of the relationship that has been built is they are understood and respected, but it's because they've been communicated so well. So in our company, I've been a part of every year since I can remember our collaboration council. I even love the name coming down to that collaboration council yes. because it shows that there is a partnership, right? I cannot do what I do without an incredible corporate team of people who support me and I honor them and I respect them. And there is a great relationship that I have with them, but they also acknowledge, Hey, there's no us without you. And so we come together on these calls and here's the thing that I will say, again, there are decisions that have to be made in the company that are far beyond me. And there are many decisions that don't involve me, but where they can involve us, Maybe it is the marketing of a promo coming up or how we're going to share something with our team, whether it's great news or maybe challenging news, right? Coming together to say, you know, what are your thoughts? What are your opinions on this? How would you do this? How should we roll this out? And I really think that cohesiveness and that collaboration has really created the grounds for where we are that when something comes up, or when a decision has to be made that maybe we don't adore, <laughs> that we can say, I understand why, but there's always the conversation that they understand why. The second piece of it too is even our compliance department, they really have operated more as an education department. Now, do they mm. have to take action on matters? Yes, absolutely. But they're so great as, as to educating people why. So it's not just, well, don't say this. 
So here's some words that work. Here's how you can say it a little bit differently. How, here's how you can tell your story a little bit differently or understanding again, why or how to do things better. And it's really working alongside us. Again, understanding that everybody's common goal is the same, not only to grow the business, but to protect the business because I want the business to be around for a really long time too, which is why for me as a top leader, I understand those conversations as we know that the regulatory landscape is changing so rapidly and it's shifting all the time. For me, I go, I get it. I understand because like I said earlier, my friend Donna Johnson, I want to have a legacy business like that too. And so it's really understanding that. But again, how you get leader buy-in is having those conversations and going above and beyond. And the last thing I will say, and I know then we talked about our founder, or not our founder, but our CEO. Sure. And when he joined our business, he went on a listening tour and went and met with top leaders. Here's the thing. That is a huge undertaking. Time, finances, all of the things to hear. What's working? What's not working? But automatically, when you have built in trust yes. with that leader, that yeah. is a game changer. So again, it requires going the next level, going the extra mile. But it's no different than what I'm going to do, right, as a leader in the sales organization as well. It's hosting the retreat. It's doing the events. It's making the extra phone calls. It's doing the call on a weekly basis, you know, whether or not I feel like it or even just need to do it, but it's continuing to be present. And that's how you continue to build. I love the frameworks Sarah just shared, gang. If you're listening in, there's a book recommendation I have for you that edifies what Sarah just said. We always love to share book recommendations here uh, on the call. Um, in addition to Sarah's book, which you should all get, if you haven't yet read Steve Cockrum's The Five Voices um, in that book, it talks about how many times you as the corporate team, you might have a voice as as a what they use, they call it pioneer. Other of you would know the word visionary. And the, when, a, when a pioneer says something or makes a statement, many times it can alienate other people inside of the culture. And you as the corporate team, right, when you have an initiative or a vision, many times when you share it, it can actually alienate a large amount of people in the field. But when you pause and take it to the field leader first, hey, here's what we're thinking. Hey, here's the initiative. Hey, here's what it is. Some of the personalities, your field leaders, um, in their book, they would call them the guardian or they would call them the nurturer. But these other people that are in your field, they can reword the way to say the same thing you wanted to say, the same initiative. And they can say it in a way that doesn't alienate you know, 70% of your field, but actually excites and energizes you know, 80% of your field. And it's just the other 20% that, oh, I don't know if that'll work. you know. And so many times we can rush too fast in some of our initiatives initiatives and miss the filter of the field of some of our best leaders who want to do that for us and to be a part of that. The second part Sarah just shared that is just critical where there is no trust, there is no relationship, right? If you want to read Mr. Covey's son's sure. book, The Speed of Trust, he just spoke a year ago right here in town. Uh, I got a chance to have lunch with him. So Stephen, is it junior, right? The second Stephen, the second Stephen Covey, right? Who wrote Speed of Trust in there. He, he advised the same thing that Sarah just shared. So it, for the owner, the new CEO at their company did go on a listing tour. And if you're wanting to create change within your organization, if you're if you're if you're you're hearing some of these things today from Sarah and you're like, I want that, I want that for my own company. Well, let me just ask, what where, where's the uh, the the trust bank account at between you and your field leaders at this moment? Some of some of you have a very high trust balance. You've already done this work. You've already invested in relationships. You've already done the lunches and the breakfasts and the dinners and the calls and the zooms and and you've done it. Some of the rest of you are uh, you're running on a negative balance and accruing high interest at the moment because uh, you haven't been putting deposits in the trust account. And if you're if you're feeling convicted on the call today and uh, you're you're uh, wanting to step out and do this and you haven't yet made the trust deposits first, uh, start right there uh, would be uh, my word to you. Just as 
Sarah Siri. Back to you, Omar. Yeah. Thank you very much for all these great insights, Sarah. Uh, what pitfalls have you seen in the past with corporate mm. initiatives, uh, with field leaders that you would invite our, our listeners to avoid? I think the biggest thing is, is I'll really offer more of a solution. I think it, you know, sometimes we think of an idea and I've even done this too, as a field leader, we think of an idea and it's like, it's a great idea. And we go and say, okay, I'm going to launch this thing. Right. And then we yeah. wonder crickets, where did everybody go? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so even in, you know, these new calls that we just relaunched, it would have been so easy for me to say, you know what, I'm just going to do this to make the links, to create the topic, to put out the schedule and just say, gang, th this is, this is what we're doing. Let's go. It would have probably taken me a 10th of the time than bringing all of the leaders together every other week to co-create and say, what topics should we cover? In what order? What platforms do we want to host them on? Do we know the answer to these questions? The answer is yes. But when there is collaboration, when we co-create, again, where we can, that is where there is going to be strength. And we saw these calls absolutely explode. So we've seen things, you know, like, okay, here's a social media initiative. And it really goes nowhere because sometimes things get lost in translation, right? There's so much information that's coming at us on a daily basis when we're on social media, in our inbox, et cetera. We have to realize the majority of people are doing this business very part-time. Yeah. And even so, even with top leaders, right? The majority of these leaders have very busy lives, right? They have families. Many of them, you know, are doing all sorts of things. And so things can get lost in translation. Things can get lost in the inbox. And then we wonder why things don't launch with the momentum that we had expected that's where, again, I think coming together in these collaboration councils to say, okay, so here's the problem. What's the solution, right? So if we're having a hard time reaching more people on social media, what is the solution? What can it look like? Here's a platform that we're looking at. What do you guys think? And again, it's because Ben, we, as you mentioned earlier, to your point, we speak two different languages. Yeah. We really do. Yeah. The way we think about things, we think about things totally different. It's about the fun, the messaging, getting the word out, et cetera. And, you know, on the corporate side, they have to think about it. It's, it's not just because they do, they have to think about things differently in order to protect the business. And so again, it's this coming together to say, Here's where we're trying to go. Yeah. You know, let's think about the best path, the best, best, you know, the best way to get there. So a good example is, and this is a, 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 a kind of a critical point that I think every company is going, okay, how can we tell our stories in a compliant way, right? Instead of a, here's the 50 trillion things not to say. It's okay, what do we need to know and understand on this end? And then from your end, right, as a field leader, what are the things you're trying to say? And let's figure out how we can say them, you know, and come together. And so really, I think that's the big thing is when we get this big idea, whether it's a corporate leader or a field leader, and we put it forth and it doesn't gain momentum, we have to go back and say, okay, did we have the conversations with the right people? Because at the end of the day, yeah. any business, right? When there's buy-in, people feel like, oh, this was part of my really great idea. I'm going to share it with others. And yeah. it gains more momentum. And the other piece of that too is then it allows there to be that poking of the holes. Like any time where we've launched something new, we've always had committees and usually they'll be under NDA. So they're not sharing what it is that they're testing or trying, but they're trying the new platform. They're giving feedback before you go and launch it to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, right? So I guess that would be a key word of wisdom too, is having these kind of subcommittees that could work on things like marketing, communication, technology, that you have some people that are trying it out. Not, by the way, not just at a leadership level. That's where we make a big mistake. Mm -hmm. We have to have, because the majority of 
the field are not yeah. leaders yet, right? Yeah. And by leaders, we use that term loosely, but meaning they haven't built to what would be considered a liter leadership level in the pay plan, right? So let's say from a title perspective, but the majority of those people that are going to be interacting with that thing or using that thing are brand new people or just sellers in the business. So what do those committees look like? Now our collaboration council, these are top leaders that have built to the top that have tenure in the company, right? So they have the same interest in investment, right? As it relates to emotional investment in seeing the thing succeed and seeing it sustain long-term. But some of these subcommittees, this is where it really benefits the company to say, do I have some brand new people? Do I have some people that are kind of building at a, you know, the mid ranks? Do I have people that are at the top that are looking at things differently in terms of let's say reporting? How are we using this report? How are they tracking things? What information are they looking for? And that you have the people who are brand new that are getting the customers and the business partners giving their feedback as well. I love that thought, Sarah, because I, I've seen this so many times is that when the initiative, you know, that's the best start possibly to an initiative when you can take the time to put together the committee of the, the people it's actually for and get their feedback. And then track afterwards. Now, I'm always yeah. amazed at how wrong we are in initiatives on the corporate side. Now, I support dozens and dozens and dozens of direct selling companies from behind the scenes uh, with software and platforms. And you know, sometimes we'll launch new social media sharing content or new messaging sequences for the, the teams. And we'll say, oh, wow, no one shares that way. Or no one even wants to share that style of content. Or that's not how they actually talk to people. And I've found what you just shared to be true so many times. It's not about oh, but we have these two grand Puba leaders in the council on the line. It's like, they're not personally recruiting right now. It's like, who yeah. who are the folks that put in, you know, five retail customers and put in two promoters, you know, over the last three weeks? Oh, interesting. Let's go get a, let's go get six, seven of them from around the country and go listen to what's going on in their life. Cause they're the, they're the one we're actually building this for. And that, that context of having the right people on the committee, it's all the difference in the world for the corporate team. And yes, uh, I mean, we see you know, that is a pivotal. We see stuff fall flat that we spend millions of dollars on or all this time and all this energy. And we say, well, <laughs> why did it Why did it fall flat? We hired the guy. We hired the girl. We spent the money. We did the thing. And, and when we fail to get buy-in from this volunteer army, right? They're not employees. It's a volunteer army of promoters. One of the analogies we share all the time uh, before we go to the last question here is that running a referral marketing company is similar to running a church, right? You can't demand that the ushers or the folks taking care of kids in the nursery or the people on the worship team <laughs> do certain things. They're not your employee. They're showing up to volunteer with their gifts and their time to serve in their community. And very much so in direct sales, even at higher leadership levels, we get confused at times on the corporate side. Those of us who are listening, if we're honest, you know, well, we're writing her this big check each month. We're writing him this big check each month. Of course we can control this. And it's uh, not really. There's still a volunteer um, inside of their world. And so when you treat it like you would a volunteer organization, because these are 1099 independent contracts for the, for the international folks on the line. They're independent contractors, right? Uh, they don't, 1099 is a very American thing. That's our, our tax code we talk about for it. But but it's it's important to keep that perspective in mind the whole way through this conversation. Now, this next question that comes from the panel, I want to give a little context for. This is for the overwhelmed executive. Okay, Sarah. So this next question, we always like to ask at the end, we have folks who have been tasked with with initiatives for the next 36 months in a row. Their schedule is yeah. completely packed and um, they're always asking for the one thing. So Omar, let's, uh, we'll hand it to you as we wrap up today. Go ahead. Thank you, Ben. Uh, if you had one thing to share with the leaders listening today as a takeaway from our time, what would that be? It, it, and that, that's coming, Sarah, from the, this is the person who's, they're saying it in like New York language, like my accent's horrible. It's like, I don't have time for anything. Like, oh, okay. Wow. What's one thing I need to do yeah. from what you're teaching me today? So hear it so, in that voice because that's where it's coming from. Building yeah. a successful, <laughs> sustainable field organization is that time is the currency of relationships. How do people know you care? It is the time you spend. Yeah. And so even yeah. though things get busy, it is carving out 
that one hour for those calls with that collaboration council, and then empowering your team. Maybe it is somebody that's head of marketing that would lead up, you know, the, the marketing people, so on and so forth, but to just, you know, really empower your leadership team to say, we want you to connect with some of our top field leaders and with some of these up and comers to really figure out what's working. And again, time, that time builds trust. And that is one of the most important commodities as it relates to our business. Because I'm telling you, when the rubber hits the road, when things change in the industry, when things change in the company, all of that will pay you back tenfold and then some, right? To have top leaders who are bought into the vision, who lock arms with one purpose to create legacy, it is the most valuable thing that you can do for the company. Regardless of how often I hear from our CEO, I trust him. That is one of the greatest gifts because again, I can lead from a place of belief and I am totally calm in the way that I am communicating. And at the end of the day, that is a great gift, not only for me, but for my team. You know, I know you mentioned earlier that sometimes we don't see the value of a leader on a leaderboard, right? Mm -hmm. We look and we say, okay, I'm writing the checks, but where are they? You know, we have Susie Q, you know, newbie Nelly, they recruited 10 people this month. Well, look at this top person and look at their check. But leaders are the rainmakers. So behind the scenes, these are the ones who are oftentimes investing their own money in retreats to build belief of other top leaders that are running aspiring leader programs that are still doing the weekly trainings 15 years plus later and the opportunity events because I can tell a strong story and help to, you know, crush the clothes, bring new customers and distributors into our business. And so it's really understanding too, and I think this is a big thing, the place for leaders in our industry. And I think that's a big conversation, you know, that leaders in our industry, that they want to know that there is a place for them to create legacy and really play the long game and build long term in these companies that are built to last. So spending that time to get to know your field and again, empowering your leadership team to communicate with those people, it's going to be one of the best investments that you can make. I enjoy that picture so much, Sarah. I, we we share this a lot in our family. We say that the, the most limited resource we have in our life is time. And so how do you love people well is a question we ask all the time. And we say, well, it's with your time. It's who you choose to spend your time with is how you show that you love and care. And people feel that and it builds real trust. Uh, Sarah, it was just a total treat uh, to have you here today. Omar, thank you for hosting the panel. Uh, for those of you that are brand new uh, to the DSEF, Direct Selling Executives Forum is, is a free organization. It doesn't cost anything to join if you're checking us out on Spotify. We're most active on LinkedIn. Uh, if you go to directsellingexecutivesforum.com, uh, you'll get access to apply uh, for free to either speak on a panel or share questions for a future panel guest uh, in our LinkedIn group. It's a total treat to have you on here today, Sarah. Wishing you all the best but there's all you're doing in, in for your team and your community and these orphans overseas. It's it's incredible to see the legacy Phil and Sarah are putting forward here together from all you're creating with with the kids and just just grateful for your time today. You have a wonderful day and we'll look forward to connect with you soon. For anyone who's on the line, go get Sarah's book, read it and eat the right. We always say with any piece of content, whether you're reading Five Voices or you're grabbing the book, any of the ones we recommend on the show, just eat the meat, spit out the bones. You're going to find some gold there. You, you want to you want to harvest a gold nugget from 17 years of Sarah's experience. Well, read the book. It's a great first place to start. Right, You're going to find something in there. It's going to be a game changer for your culture. Thank you so much for being on here today. We'll talk with you soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Sarah. If you haven't yet joined the DSEF group on LinkedIn, go to directsellingexecutiveforum.com or go on LinkedIn and search for Direct Selling Executive Forum to apply. The group is free and is an invite-only community of direct selling executives by direct selling executives. Oh, 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 oh